Hi booktube! I'm here today with a video about a book. I hesitate to call it a review. It's more of a jumping off point. Um, so the book is Red X by David Demchek and let me just tell you about this book. Uh, so this book was inspired by some real murders that happened um, in Toronto's gay village between uh, 2010 and 2017. Um, I'm pretty sure if you're from Canada <laughs> you know what I'm talking about. Um, it's a supernatural horror comprised of interconnected stories uh, featuring LGBTQ plus characters over the decades. I believe it starts in the 80s and goes until the 2010s. And it's set against a backdrop of uh, queer history. Um, starting with the AIDS crisis and then moving into different issues um, that have happened. But each story is interspersed uh, with um, the author's own personal history. So all the stories are interconnected in that the murderer is the same person um, and there's some characters that are featured across all the stories. And then in between we get David Demchuk's. I'm not sure how much of it is completely true um, and how much of it is fictionalized but it is based somewhat on his own life um, and his own thoughts as well and that's where I'm jumping off here about a particular section that had to do with queerness and horror and the history that those two things have. So the horror is real. Um, this is based on real murders, um, a real villain. Um, so based on a true serial killer um, that happened in Toronto's gay village. And there's Booth MacArthur. He killed eight men, mostly uh, South Asian immigrants. Um, and there is um, mention of South Asian uh, man um, being murdered in the book as well. And Dumbtruck included two characters that were similar to his real life victims, but he also kind of expanded upon it as well. And he did not pit a uh, MacArthur stand-in. Um, I think that's important because we don't want to give... I feel kind of odd even saying his name, but I feel like I have to say his name so that you know what I'm talking about. But he didn't put like a stand-in in his book. The danger is based on reality, but his villain is more supernatural. Um, and it has a basis in queer horror as well. Um, and queer history. Or history that we speculate on. Um, yeah. So, queer coded, what does the word mean? Um, literature, um, I'm talking about specifically here. Um, in horror literature, there's often queer coded characters um, that are not overtly um, queer. Um, so, what does that mean? Uh, so, the sexual identity of the characters is not explicitly stated or confirmed, but through the use of, you know, certain traits, certain stereotypes, certain mannerisms, the audience can recognize that character as a queer person. Or, not even, they're not always people. <laughs> um, I think of uh, Ursula, you know, she's not technically a person, she's an octo person. Anyways. Um, some traits include, you know, effeminate manners or costumes on men, um, or stereotypically queer hobbies or occupations. Again, we think of like male hairdressers and that kind of thing. One of the most well-known queer-coded characters already mentioned is Ursula, um, and she was actually modeled after the drag queen Divine, um, so, you know, very obviously queer-coded there. Um, and a lot of queer-coded characters are actually villains. Um, just look at any a Disney villain. If uh, you're a millennial, you'll know of him from Powerpuff Girls. Um, so a lot of this has to do with the um, legalities of homosexuality, um, specifically like decency laws and stuff that prevented um, obvious queerness. Um, so for example, the Hayes Code and cinema, where positive portrayals of homosexuality were actually banned. Um, so to get around the ban, uh, queer characters were either killed off, um, that's kind of known as the barrio gays uh, stereotype or trope, um, or villains or their evil characters who have to get punished, or if they're in a romantic relationship it has to end in tragedy. Um, so let's talk about queer horror in literature, specifically a little timeline here. We could begin with mythology. 
Uh, it's, it's not really horror, but we have our first queer coded characters, you know, Achilles, Patrocles, um, in the Iliad, um, the Genji, um, in 11th century Japanese work, Tale of Genji, um, we have Sappho writing, uh, those poems, um, and then laws such as the Buggery Act of 1533, which made overt queer themes dangerous to publish. Um, and the rise of gothic literature, which um, often has horror elements in it, um, and queer authors writing in that, such as Matthew Lewis, who wrote The Monk in 1796. Um, main characters um, in that, the main character, the main character in The Monk actually falls in love with another man, um, although it's revealed that they were a woman all along, you know, because has, that has to happen. Um, we get Frankenstein by Mary Shelley. Uh, it's a queer coded, you know, the love for this monster, this perfect man that he's created. Um, Carmilla by Sheridan uh, Le Fanon in 1872 is about lesbian vampires. Uh, of course, they're bad guys. Um, Dracula actually claims Jonathan Harker in 1897. Vampires, um, not this kind, though, um, maybe, <laughs> um, are often queer coded. Um, and of course, we have. Um, Oscar Wilde, a picture of Dorian Gray, um, could be called horror, um, and the love that dare not speak its name. So we get this, um, so we're gonna go back to, to vampires, and there's a big appeal in um, queer horror to them, um, and queer identifying people, because um, they can identify and relate to vampires. They have to hide, um, they have to have a lot of secrecy around them, they have this forbidden passion, they have a fear of discovery. They've gone from something to fear, um, to something to fear and celebrate. Now we have Anne Rice um, in the 1980s, you know, a <laughs> hundred years later, we see a rise in queer fantasy and science fiction. Um, you know, her her whole um, Lestat and Louis thing, right? Um, pulp horror um, published in the 1950s um, that came around the time, the same time as the Kinsey um, publicized his studies on sexuality. We know the Kinsey scale. Uh, which um, everyone falls on the scale. Um, not everyone's 100% straight or 100% gay. They're all somewhere in the middle. Um, yeah, and that increased an interest in the population to read about same-sex relationships and pulp horror. And pulp, in general, appealed to that in the 1950s. It was often written under pseudonyms because, again, there was a fear of backlash or danger from publishing this stuff. But they still needed a tragic ending to kind of get past censorships as well. And then we have the rise of AIDS, um, events like Stonewall were happening, and overt attention started to be demanded. Um, and then we see the rise then of LGBTQ plus presses, uh, such as Allison Press and Firebrand Books, and then the influence of queer horror films. We look at John Waters, the Rocky Horror Picture Show, um, and the present day where queer characters in horror can be explicit, explicitly open as either victims, villains, or heroes. So let's go back to Red X. Um, Demchek includes an essay there um, as part of the autobiographical narrative that he includes, where he explores his own feelings grappling with the horror genre as a gay man and the history from that. And I'm going to read some excerpts from his essay here. So this is what uh, Demchek had to say about uh, horror in Red X. So, I'm, re I'm quoting directly from David Chemchuk here. For most of its history, horror has been an inherently conservative genre, as fear is an innately conservative emotion, and horror has traditionally been employed to uphold conservative values. The triumph of the virtuous, the punishment of the wicked, the rejection of the different, the dissident, the unknown, the preservation of family, country, and God. As I write in the genre, I continue to have to question whether I am demonizing sides of myself that I should be embracing and celebrating, my values, my relationships, my sexuality, my otherness. For centuries, queerness and horror have been intertwined. Horror relying on queerness for shock and pungency, and queerness relying on horror for visibility and validation. With the arrival of gothic novels, the early Victorian thrillers known as sensation novels, pulp novels, and penny dreadfuls, we step into the spotlight in one of the few great leading roles we are allowed to fully inhibit, the villain. In such works as Matthew Lewis's The Monks, Sheridan Le Fanu's Carmilla, Oscar Wilde's pictured Dorian Gray, and Bram Stoker's Dracula, who warns his brides as they approach Jonathan Harker, he belongs to me. Queer attractions and subtexts could suddenly be explored, 
and queer characters could take a role at the heart of the story, albeit as predatory and naturals, with perverse desires, seeking out innocence, including children and animals to corrupt and consume. If you read a story from this period that depicts a secret side, a hideous transformation, a debilitating disease, a tainted bloodline, wanton decadence, unbridled hedonism, a duplicitous nature, a twilight underworld, you are likely confronting a carefully coded example of queer horror. At least for a while it was better to be seen as a monster than to remain unseen. However, in our zeal to use the genre to portray some aspect of ourselves, what we most often revealed or were required to reveal was our self-hatred. In the 1950s and 60s, the lines between good and evil began to blur, the anti-hero became a dominant protagonist, and the prim, prudish, unfailingly heterosexual heroes were subtly marked for their dullness, while the outlandish monsters and murderers were quietly cheered for the rejection of societal norms. As LGBTQ communities became more vocal and visible in our demands for civil rights, portrayals of queer monsters and villains and grotesques were decried as homophobic and transphobic. As a queer young man who loved horror, who like many was drawn to darkness, I struggled as I confronted images of myself and my friends that openly maligned us and recoiled with a different kind of fear as I imagined my parents, my employers and co-workers, my straight friends and their families seeing these films as legitimate depictions of my life, my experience, and my desires. More recently, an increase in the psychological complexity of its monsters and the conflicted nature of its heroes and victims has happened in queer horror. I've had to reckon with my own personal history with queer horror, how it has shaped my view of my community and of myself. So much of it is about the aspects in queer culture that straight people fear, that straight society fears. Strength and independence in women, vulnerability and intimacy in men, the upending of gender and family roles, the repudiation of the primacy of reproduction, the hollowness and bankruptcy of the dominant social structures, challenges to the pronouncements of the church and our intrinsic invisibility, our insidiousness, that we could be anyone, anywhere, hiding in plain sight. I have to admit there's something delicious in that, that we would provoke so much unease, so much discomfort, so much irrational, unfounded terror just by existing. But what are queer people afraid of, apart from the obvious? That wasn't all just one big chunk, that was just little ex excerpts here and there from the essay that he included in this book. Is queer horror helpful or harmful? These are just kind of my personal thoughts now. Um, he, he mentioned at one part, um, is it better to be seen as a monster than to remain unseen? You know, being acknowledged as existing, having your actions and beliefs noticed can be important for marginalized people who would otherwise feel invisible. Clinging to what is available to have that validation and create awareness is, is a legitimate thing to, to strive for. Recognizing the fiction versus real life, you know, where certain cultural, legal realities prevent overt positive portrayals, not idolizing real villains in life, like Bruce MacArthur, could be damaging to those without critical thinking skills to separate reality from fiction. It can also reinforce stereotypes of queer people as abnormal, dangerous, or having an agenda. What is this gay agenda that Christians keep banging on about as if it's a bad thing? This is a gay agenda. Monday, drink iced coffee. Tuesday, expensive brunch. Wednesday, rewatch Shit's Creek. Thursday, cuddle my boyfriend. Friday, drink champagne. Saturday, moisturize. Sunday, buy plants. What's wrong with that? On the other hand, being seen as a monster can help protect people or deter threats. Identifying with monsters is something else that can happen through queer horror, you know, masking, concealing who you really are from unaccepting people, living outside of societal norms, a freer expression of gender norms, the duality of being closeted, you know, two-sided monsters like Dr. Jekyll, Mr. Hyde, or even just like werewolves as a more generic example. And it could also represent embracing unconventional desires and being unapologetic and authentic. And it's not a monolith. Queer horror and queer people are not a monolith, and it could help normalize queerness. So queer people, like non-queer people, can be bad people. And if we can separate their moral failings from their sexuality, which is not a moral or ethical issue, we can then shift perspectives and normalize queerness. And also, just like plain up, villains are cool. Like, look at all these well-loved characters in pop culture. They tend to be more complex than straightforward good guys with, and they have relatable flaws, 
they can satisfy our morbid curiosity or the darker aspects of humanity or what society perceives as darkness such as you know homosexuality and queerness it can also be a catharsis an emotional release of intense emotions and uh, exploring moral dilemmas it's a subversion of expectations that can be thrilling and it can help challenge conventional morality and help progress they can also just be plain entertaining there's a lot of iconic lines from villains you know why so serious here's johnny i ate his liver with some fava beans and a nice chiante like you know that's <laughs> those are fun iconic lines that people know and you have to tell you who the characters are you know who they are and you know where would the drama be the tension where would that come from in a lot of works if it wasn't for the villain uh so that's my thoughts on Red X and queer horror. Let me know your own thoughts down below and thank you for watching.